I'm Keith R.A. DeCandido, and this is the latest episode of Crad COVID Readings. Finishing off our one story a year theme, sort of, uh, from the aughts, uh, I read a 2006 story on Monday, a 2007 story on Wednesday, and today I am reading a story that was published in 2008. Um, it's also a story that I'm haven't been able, I don't know where you can find it now or if you can even find it anywhere. Uh, so this is kind of a nice thing for you guys because uh, this is probably the only place you can find this story right now. Uh, I sold it to Battlecore.com. Uh, Battlecore.com is a site dedicated to Battletech. Uh, and this is a story that takes place in the classic Battletech setting. Uh, but it is no longer on the site, and I don't think it's been reprinted anywhere. So um, I was invited to contribute to the Battletech universe by Lauren L. Coleman, who is one of the uh, caretakers of Battletech uh, currently uh, in the 21st century. Uh, he owns Catalyst Games Labs, which, which bought the rights uh, from uh, FASA, which no longer exists. Um, it, I, I'm oversimplifying. Uh, the, the, the rights situations of Battletech is incredibly complicated. But uh, Lauren invited me to do a story for Battlecore.com because they were running short stories for, uh, for subscribers to the website. Um, as I said, I don't know um, if this story is available anywhere else, uh, but it's here now, so I'm going to read it to you. It's a classic Battletech story called Mayo. The samurai stood in the field of battle. His katana gri gripped in his right hand fist and hanging down, angled toward the grass. The click-clop of horse hooves was barely audible at first, building to a crescendo as the four bandits rose toward him. The bandits shouted inarticulately, snarls of rage at this one man who dared to oppose them. As they came within a few feet of the samurai, the bandits pulled up their reins. The steady beat of the horse hooves became a rapid-fire staccato as the mounts came to a halt, their breaths coming in snorts. The samurai did not move, did not look up at the bandits, but continued to stare ahead. The katana remained in its downward slant. For a moment, there was silence, broken only by the snorting of the horses. Then one of the bandits demanded to know what his business was here. Still, the samurai neither moved nor spoke. Again, the bandits demanded to know why he came to this place as if the regular pillaging of the village wasn't common knowledge, as if they could get away with coming here each year and stealing crops, as if their crippling of the town's ability to pay their taxes to the shogun would go unnoticed by Ido. With a kick, the lead bandit started his horse toward the samurai, screaming at him that he would die. At that, the samurai almost reacted with shock. Were these fools so base as to believe that death was any kind of threat? He lived his life by the code of Bushido, fully prepared to die in the service of his master. The reality of death was always with him, a robe he wore at all times. One did not live by the sword unless one expected to someday die by it. The horse rode closer. Still the samurai did not move, the katana still hanging down. Raising his sword, the bandit cried as he came upon the samurai. Even as the bandit's sword started its downward slash, the samurai's katana finally moved, slicing upward through the air and into the bandit's chest, continuing through his neck, sawing through his clavicle. Blood flew everywhere as the bandit screamed in pain and fell to the ground. The horse galloped onward even as its rider fell earthward, his death mere minutes away. Ignoring him, the samurai moved to a ready stance. For several seconds, the remaining bandits sat atop their horses, dumbfounded. From what the samurai had been told, these bandits had been together for many years. No doubt they believed themselves to be invincible immortal. The samurai intended to prove them wrong on both counts. Recovering, the three bandits rode as one toward the samurai, bellowing of revenge and destruction. Again, the samurai did not move until it was required. When the second bandit, whose horse galloped at a greater rate than that of his fellows, was upon him, the samurai sliced off his leg at the thigh, the katana easily carving through meat and muscle and bone. His katana had been forged by a master sword crafter, and few were deemed worthy to carry one of his works of art. Fewer still had the skill to use them properly. Even as the second bandit fell to the ground, screaming in agony as blood poured from the stump that his right leg had become, the samurai whirled around and struck at the third bandit. This one managed to parry, but the bl his blade was not forged by a master sword crafter. 
The katana sliced through it as easily as rice paper, the sound of metal shattering metal echoing off the trees. While the third bandit stared dumbly at the remains of his weapon, the samurai turned to parry a strike by the fourth. Rotating his wrist around, the katana slid across the fourth bandit's blade and shoved it downward, forcing him to drop it. The samurai then thrust the katana into the fourth bandit's chest. Turning, he saw that the third bandit had decided to turn and flee rather than face the battle unarmed. The samurai was torn. On the one hand, the bandit was a coward fleeing in the middle of a fight like that. On the other hand, he had shown his true face, for these bandits had already proven themselves to be cowards many time over, times over. He was only being true to his nature. Bending down, the samurai picked up the hilt of the third bandit's broken sword, abandoned in retreat. Rearing back his arm, the samurai threw the hilt with all his might at the third bandit. The edge of the broken blade penetrated the back of the bandit's neck. He slumped forward, even as the horse continued onward. Looking around, the samurai nodded his approval. The first and fourth bandits were dead at his feet, and the second would be before long. His work was done. He turned and started walking back toward the town. No doubt the villagers would offer him gifts, or at least a meal, but he would not accept. He was, after all, only doing his duty to the shogun, and to accept any recompense was unseemly and dishonorable. It was a long trip back to Edo, and he had a report to make. As he strode, he thought he heard a strange voice in the back of his head saying something in a foreign tongue. Another victory for a vision of judgment over his enemies. This is Mario Guardado, Mar Marico Guardado, live from Cilicia's Coliseum in Solaris City, wishing you good night. The word of Blake's soldier in the booth with Marico Guardado had a crew cut, broad shoulders, and no discernible neck. He also carried a huge gun, the size of which made Mariko wonder what he was compensating for. The soldier, who carried the rank of Acolyte, also had an expression on his face indicating that he wouldn't hesitate to use the gun if Mariko didn't do exactly what Word of Blake wanted. Not that there was any doubt that she would. Mariko had seen what happened to people who went against Word of Blake. Mariko had announced several of their deaths. Two more of them had just died, blown to smithereens by the man in the white mech called Vision of Judgment, with another two on their way out. Better still, it was all on live tribid, being sent out to anyone the, in the inner sphere who wanted to watch a massacre. This isn't what I signed on for, she thought, even as she said, Vision, Vision of Judgment's laser makes short work of Oliver's chest plate. Looks like Oliver won't live to regret that Goss attack on Vision's flank. And now Branmet has turned and is running away. Mariko spoke for the benefit of the audio receptors in the booth that transmitted her vocal commentary along with the visuals of the fight. She had no idea what the names that had been assigned to Vision of Judgment's foes were in reference to. They were four battered Tietzang mechs with minimal weaponry, probably not even piloted by their original users. They were going up against a single, state-of-the-art vanquisher, which some bright lad in Word of Blake's marketing department had named Vision of Judgment to emphasize what was going on in the Colosseum these days. Sure as hell wasn't a game anymore. The vanquisher had already already blown, blown off Sukdar's shoulder assembly and Bruner's leg before it took out Oliver, and now it raised its right arm towards Branmet, not even giving chase. Vision of Judgment is firing its Goss gun. The vanquisher's arm cannon blew around into the teeth sang's back, and Branmet has also fallen. Mariko could hear the cheers that she knew were manufactured by the engineers downstairs. Certainly, these noises of joy weren't coming from the desultory faces of the people forced to sit in the seats to give the illusion of a packed house of eager fans. The lighting was arranged in such a way that no one could see their faces anyway, just register that they were there and assume that the cheers came from them rather than a recording. The final tally, Mariko said, trying to sound excited, is four kills. Another victory for Vision of Judgment over his enemies. This is Mariko Guardado, live from Cilicia's Coliseum in Solaris City, wishing you good night. There was a time when she did this alongside a color commentator, a former mech warrior named Patricia Bracken. Nerve damage during a campaign against some mercs about ten years back left her incapable of running a mech anymore, so she took a job on Solaris City, providing insight into the workings of the mechs for the games. It had been an excellent arrangement. Patricia wasn't the most charismatic person in the inner sphere, but she knew her stuff, and she and Mariko had developed a rapport over the past few years, 
with Mariko knowing just what questions to ask to get the best and most informative answers out of Patricia. Visually, they were a nice contrast as well. Mariko was beautiful. Modesty didn't prevent her from thinking that, as she paid good money for her looks. Genetics helped, of course. She was born with soft Asian eyes and lovely olive skin. But the lustrous black hair with just enough curl, the button nose, the warm lips, the enticing cleavage, all of those had been bought and paid for. Patricia, though, didn't bother with any of that. A middle-aged veteran of more combat than Mariko could imagine. Her face looked like it was made of leather, her steel-gray hair like it was made of wire brush, her ice-blue eyes surrounded by bags. Her face was full of the very same lines Mariko had paid to remove, but for her, they added character, showed that she knew what she was talking about when she described the why a mech warrior did this or that in the ring. Within a year of their being paired up, Mariko and Patricia's voices and faces were known all over the inner sphere. True, they weren't on the same level as Julie and Nero, no one was, but they had a following. Between gaming sessions, they often did tours together, as well as speaking engagements, interviews, and more. Patricia had even hired a writer to ghost her life story, and it had the second highest read rate of any book downloaded out of Solaris. The top spot, of course, was taken by Nero's wretched, fact-free autobiography, Circling the Ring. Then, word of Blake took over. For a time, the Colosseum was shut down. But soon, word of Blake, communications experts that they were, realized the value of good propaganda, and in turning Solaris's best export, the games, against them. What once were contests of skill now became executions, thinly disguised as the same old competitions. At first, it had been one-sided, several white vanquishers fighting against some hapless combine mech or other who'd been captured in the fighting. Then, suddenly, things changed. The vision of judgment showed up, and instead of four Word of Blake mechs against one, it was the other way around. Not that the results ever changed. The white mechs always won, the other mechs always lost, violently. Mariko had no idea who was in Vision of Judgment. She didn't much care, either. If nothing else, whoever it was made for better tried it. Beating the odds was always more fun than watching a foregone conclusion. Not that it wasn't foregone in any case, but at least the one-on-four numbers created the illusion. And as went the propaganda war, so went the physical one. Word of Blake had won a decisive upset victory at the City of Nowhere, where they had defeated a legion led by the legendary Shihan Giuseppe Kishi, probably the most storied combine mech on Solaris since the death of Theodore Gross. He was so well regarded, he was given the title of Shihan, Japanese for master, rather than a military rank. He had won many victories against Word of Blake, until nowhere, where he was lost and officially listed as missing and presumed killed in action. Mariko had interviewed Kishi a few times in the past, before she got the Silesia gig, and he had always been taciturn and self-effacing. She had always admired that quality, and had been devastated to learn of his defeat. With the game ended, Mariko got up from her bed. The word of Blake soldier pushed the button to open the door to the booth. The acolyte wasn't her only escort. She had three, each of whom took an eight-hour shift. She had started thinking of them as tail, pale, and male after a comedy trio that had been popular when she was a girl. This one was male, who disguised himself, who distinguished himself by having gray in the stubble of his crew cut. Tail had unusually wide brown eyes, and Pale was the only one who was dark-skinned. Usually, after a game, she and Patricia would chat with the engineering staff for a bit, then go out to a tavern for drinks and a late dinner, sometimes chatting up their fans, sometimes sitting alone in their corner booth just talking about life. Sometimes they'd go back to either her place or Patricia's, though that had lessened the last year or so, as Patricia was feeling more experimental than Marigo was willing to be in bed. When word of Blake took over, though, Patricia had disappeared. To this day, Mariko had no idea if she was dead or alive. Dead seemed more likely. Solaris had a lot more corpses these days. The tavern Mariko and Patricia used to frequent had been destroyed in the fighting, ironically by a combine mech, and fraternization among the tribe and staff was no longer permitted. So she went straight home, escorted by mail. Her fame had given her a few perks, though Mariko hardly considered them such, including permission to keep her spacious apartment. Of course, mail stayed posted outside the door at all times, to be relieved later by pale and then tail. They never came inside, another perk, a modicum of privacy, but she wasn't allowed to 
walk around outside unescorted by one of the three. At no point during the ride from the Colosseum to her apartment did Mail speak. Mariko had never heard him or either of his comrades speak. They all grunted a lot and gave instructions by gesturing. Mariko didn't want to think about what would happen if she misinterpreted the gesture. Probably something involving the big gun. Mariko kicked off her shoes as she entered her place, wandered into the kitchen, pulled a meal box out of the cooler, and tossed it into the cooker. The boxed meals all tasted like steamed mush, regardless of what it looked like. This particular one claimed to be teriyaki steak with mushrooms and roasted potatoes, but all food tasted like that to Mariko these days, so she didn't see the point in spending money on good food. I wish Patricia had taken her with me. She snorted at that thought. Right, like she'd be willing to be dragged down by me. Face it, she's a former soldier. She's trained for shit like this. Me? The only thing I'm trained in how to do is not pop my peas. I'd be dead in an hour. Plus, of course, there was the very real possibility that Patricia was also dead. That would probably be an improvement, she thought sadly as the cooker beeped. She took it outside and started shoveling the theoretical steak into her mouth, not even bothering to sit down at the table. She just wanted to eat and go to bed. I'd take a dream suppressant first. It was the only way to get through the night anymore. The samurai sat in wait. The shogun had been fulsome with praise for his work against the bandits. Well, fulsome for the shogun in any case. The leader of all Nippon was not one to gush. What he did allow is how the samurai had performed his duties with honor and with success, and that he remained worthy of his title. The samurai was pleased with his lord's praise. Now he waited in his home, the paper doors closed, kneeling in Sei's opposition on the tatami mat. He was in a meditative trance. He came out of the trance when he heard the front door slide open. The samurai was not expecting visitors. His katana lay sheathed at his side. His right hand moved toward the top of the scabbard, his thumb resting on the end of the hilt, prepared to flick the sword out at a moment's notice. When the door slid open to reveal a young man also kneeling in Seiza, the samurai removed his hand from the katana. This was the shogun's messenger. He carried the shogun's seal, but the samurai did not require it. He knew the boy by sight. Forgive my intrusion, the messenger said, but I bring news from our lord, the shogun. Enter and deliver your message, the samurai said, his fists resting on his thighs. The messenger rose, slid the door shut, and then knelt before the samurai. The shogun has another task for you, my lord. I live to serve our lord, the shogun. Speak and tell me his wishes. In measured tones, the messenger spelled out for the samurai what his next task was to be. Nodding, the samurai said, I hear the message and I obey. Do you require a refreshment before your journey back to the shogun's palace? Shaking his head, the messenger bowed and said, as he always did, No, my lord, I must return forthwith. With that, he rose to his feet, went to the door, knelt, opened the door, went to the other side, knelt again, closed it, and then took his leave. The samurai returned to his meditation. It would be a long journey tomorrow, and he needed to be of clear mind. The next morning, after Mariko had slept past noon and tossed her breakfast meal box into the cooker, this one claimed to be fish, muffins, and soprasada rolls, she heard a sound she'd never heard before, her guard's voice. Checking the clock on the cooker, she saw that it was one o'clock, which was a shift change. Her guard, it would have been pale, being relieved by tail, was yelling at someone. Curious as to what was going on, this was the most active any of her escorts had been, she went to the front door ignoring the beeping of the cooker, indicating that her breakfast was ready. The door slid open to reveal an acolyte she didn't recognize. This one was female, stocky, with thick dark hair, several scars on her heavily lined face, green eyes, and a large nose. She carried a gun that was even bigger than the one Male carried. Pale and Tail had smaller weapons, which had led to Mariko's presumptions about Male's need to compensate. She was arguing with Pale. I'm just going where I'm told, acolyte. Pale whirled around, his dark skin flushed with anger. Inside, he snarled at her, which were the first two coherent syllables he'd ever uttered in her direction. What's going on? To Mariko, the new acolyte said, This isn't your concern, ma'am. Then to Pale, she said, I got my orders, acolyte. You want to see him? Knock yourself out. She reached into one of the many pouches that Word of Blake uniforms came equipped with and pulled out a small reader. Snatching it angrily, Pale put his thumb on the side of the reader, 
and then gazed over the words on the display. His face went from anger to disbelief to disappointment and back to anger again, all in about a second and a half. It was a wider range of expression than Mariko had thought the man capable of. Fine, Pale said as he practically shoved the reader back at the woman's face. With a calm that was in direct contrast to Pale's irritation, the acolyte accepted the reader, put it back in the pouch, then stood at attention and saluted. I relieve you. Still slump-shouldered, Pale raised his right hand to his forehead. I stand relieved. The two saluted each other, and then Pale walked off. As soon as Pale disappeared into the lift, the acolyte angry, angrily turned on Mariko and pointed her gun right at her head. Inside, bitch! Now! Mariko swallowed and slowly backed into her apartment. What's going- Shut up! The acolyte followed her in, the gun still pointed at her head. As soon as the door slid shut behind the acolyte, both were now standing in the living room, the latter reached into another pouch with her left hand, right hand still aiming the gun at Mariko. To Mariko's object confusion, the device the acolyte now held in her left hand was a privacy seal. Mariko used it on interviews sometimes to prevent ambient noise and signals from interfering with the conversation. To her horror, she also realized that it could be used to mask the sound of Mariko being killed by the gun in the acolyte's right hand. She activated the seal by pressing a control on it, causing a red light to go on. As soon as she did, as soon as it did, she lowered the gun. It's okay, Miko. We can talk. Mariko blinked, confused. Why was this soldier calling her by a nickname that had only been used by her parents, her brother, and... Patricia? Grinning, the acolyte grabbed her nose and appeared to rip it off, but it was just a prosthetic. She then tore off the scarring on her face and removed her black wig to reveal a more familiar buzz cut. It was, indeed, Patricia Brackett, albeit now with green eyes. Mariko supposed it was part of the disguise. Oh my god, Patricia! What? How? What? Unable to complete a sentence, or even a thought, she instead leapt forward and grabbed Patricia in a tight hug. It's good to see you too, kiddo. Still clutching Patricia as if for dear life, Mariko asked, What happened? Pulling out of the embrace, Patricia said, Long story, Miko, and I'll be happy to tell you in a bit. But first, we got business to discuss. Mind if I sit? Mariko spurted out a laugh. <laughs> You're the one holding the gun. Oh, yeah. She looked down at the weapon as if noticing she was carrying it for the first time. Sorry about that. Had to stay in character, you know? What character? Where'd you get a privacy seal? What the fuck is going on, Patricia? If you just shut the hell up for a second, I'll tell you. She fell more than sat on Mariko's small couch. I'd kill for a beer. You still keep some Sapporo in the house? Mariko nodded and moved toward the kitchen. I've got only got two cans left. The supply lines were cut a month ago, so there hasn't been any new beer. She opened the cooler, ignoring the display on the cooker that indicated that her breakfast was done, and pulled out the last two beers. Sapporo was an old Japanese beer that Mariko had introduced Patricia to. It had become the latter's favorite drink, and they often had it together. Mariko hadn't been able to bear the idea of drinking them without even knowing if Patricia was alive or dead. Taking a seat on the easy chair perpendicular to the couch, Mariko handed Patricia one of these squat silver polymer cans and pulled open the lid of hers. So what's going on? Where have you been? Where? Patricia held up a hand. Hang on. She leaned her head back and took a very long drink of the beer. God, that hits the spot. I haven't had a good beer since the weenies of Blake showed up. She set her beer down on the coffee table. Okay, here's the deal. I need you to go to work within the next ten minutes or so. Mariko frowned, still holding her beer can without drinking from it. I'm not supposed to be at the studio for another two hours. What? Patricia leaned forward. What about the pregame? We don't do that anymore. We don't do anything anymore. I show up, I call the plays, I go home. No pregame, no interviews, no wrap-up, nothing. They only still use me because my voice is associated with Silesius, and they want to hew as close as they can to the old games. So why the fuck don't they do pregame? Patricia knocked back some more beer. All right, forget it. We'll come up with another excuse. I might be able to forge new orders on the reader. It's tricky, though. Acolyte Duban Dubizana usually goes straight to the Farsi Club after his shift's over, but he might get all pissed about me replacing a Acolyte Osborne. So we could go back to HQ, in which case we're fucked. Mariko assumed that Dubizana and Osborne were pale and tail. Patricia! All of a sudden, Patricia bounded to her feet, the gun swinging around and hitting her on the side. Mariko had never seen her partner like this. In the booth, she was always calm and a little snarky, 
But now she was a bundle of energy, looking ready to use that gun at a moment's notice. Just hope she doesn't just decide to use it on me. We need to get Kishi out. At that, Mariko almost dropped her beer. Kishi? Shihan Kishi? No, Private Kishi, the guy who cleans the latrines. Of course Shihan Kishi! Mariko set her beer down on the coffee table and stood up. She was half a head taller than Patricia, and she felt the need to take advantage of that. Shihan Kishi's dead. Patricia blinked. He was killed? Damn it, I thought the games were all rigged. When did this happen, last night? He died when he lost it. Nowhere. Patricia, you're not making any sense. I, I'm not making any sense? Miko, you see Kishi every day from the booth. What are you... Then all of a sudden, Mariko realized what Patricia was talking about. Oh my god. Vision of Judgment, that's Kishi? You didn't know? Throwing up her hands, Mariko said, Of course I didn't know! They don't tell me a damn thing! I told you, I show up, I call the plays, you go home. Right. Fuck. Patricia took a breath. A Vision of Judgment is Kishi, and my job is to get him out. There'll be a shot in the arm to the Combine, and it'll kick the wankers of Blake's propaganda right in the balls. Bitterly, Mariko said, Let me guess. You escort me to work, and then sneak down to the barracks and get him out. Bingo. That's insane. Now it was Patricia's turn to shrug. Desperate times and all that. Look, you're in the clear. It's acolyte Yanadi who will take the heat. That's the ID you borrowed? Mariko asked, to wish Patricia nodded. And you got that where, exactly? From some people who want Kishi out. And no, I'm the one to do it. I know my way around Silesius. I've got combat experience and the wimps of Blake haven't captured me yet. Plus, I got it in with you. Mariko grabbed her beer and gulped the rest of it down. I haven't said yes yet, Patricia. Grinning, she said, Come on, Miko, how can you say no? This is a chance to reverse the biggest setback the Combine has suffered, not to mention getting in good with, with Curita. Having spent far too long choosing her words properly, not to mention over a decade of interviewing people, Mariko knew a hiccup when she heard it. It wasn't Curita she would be getting in good with. Who are you working for, Patricia? Looking down, Patricia muttered, It doesn't matter. It for damn sure it does. You only mutter like that when you're hiding something. Talk to me, Patricia. Who are you working for? Someone had to give you those toys and a way to get rid of my escort. As she spoke, she saw it. Shit. You're in bed with the Yakuza. I am not in bed with the Yakuza. Oh, come off it, Patricia. Mariko stomped into the kitchen. There's nobody else on Solaris with the resources to pull this off who'd have anything to gain by springing Kishi. They'd turn him over to the Combine and they'd be sitting pretty. Now tell me I'm wrong. You're wrong. I'm not in bed with them. I'm just doing a job. Mariko rolled her eyes. Right! Because mobsters are notorious for practicing the live and let live philosophy. Patricia walked up to Mariko, slung her gun behind her back, and put her hands on Mariko's shoulders. I'm telling you, Miko, it's just a job. They need me, and I need them. That didn't sound right. How do you need them? Never mind. Shrugging off Patricia's arms, Mariko said, What do you mean, never mind? I want to know. It's none of your business. I tell it isn't. Patricia, we've been partners for years, both in the booth and in the bedroom. What can't you tell me? A lot. And this ain't your concern, all right? Just trust me. Trust you. You come in here out of nowhere, after no word, for months. Asked me to smuggle you into the stronghold of Word of Blake's propaganda machine to sneak out their greatest weapon on behalf of the fucking mob? And you want me to trust you? I don't even want to go along with this. I could get killed. Snarling now, Patricia wagged her finger at Mariko. Don't tell me about getting killed, Nico. I spent 20 years writing a mech on 10 different worlds. I went up against the worst the major houses could throw at me, and you're still here. I've heard this speech before, Patricia. The two women stared at each other for several seconds. Mariko's arms were folded defiantly. The truth was, she wanted more than anything to help Patricia, to rescue Shihan Kishi, to feel like she was doing something. But she was also pissed at Patricia for just assuming she'd go along with it, that Mariko would follow Patricia's lead. I need to do this, Nico, Patricia finally said in a tight voice, and I can't do it without you. Now will you help me? Will you help the cause? Or not? Mariko chuckled bitterly. The only cause being served here was the Yakuza's. She also had one final objection. What if Kishi doesn't want to come? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say. And I've heard you say some seriously stupid shit, Miko. He's a prisoner. Why would... He's vision of judgment. I sit there in that damned booth every fucking night, and I watch him blow combine prisoners into scrap metal. What if he's doing it willingly? 
What if he's gone over to where to Blake? That's not possible. Patricia started pacing again. He's he's Kishi, for Christ's sake. We got intel that he's been brainwashed, and I've got a way to reverse it if I can get close. Mariko sat back down on her chair. I hope to hell you're right, Patricia. Because if he doesn't want to go, they're going to need a DNA scanner to identify, ID the bodies when he's done with us. Eyes widening, Patricia sat on the sofa and stared at Mariko. You'll do it? Letting out a long sigh, Patricia said, <sighs> Yeah, I'll do it. The Ronin had been given the option of how the duel was to be settled. Because the Ronin was an honorable man once, the samurai granted him choice in the manner of his death. To the samurai's surprise, the Ronin had chosen to fight by hand. The samurai wondered if the Ronin knew of the samurai's proficiency at karate. Perhaps the Ronin thought his own skills to be equal to the task. Either way, the samurai needed to prepare. He began by doing several stretching exercises to limber his muscles. As he did so, he heard his name being called. Or rather, not his name. He responded instinctively, even though his name was not Giuseppe. It was, Giuseppe? Shian Kishi, you have to come with me. Shian? That didn't make any sense. The samurai was a senpai, a senior student of karate, not a master. And what kind of name was Giuseppe? Then he saw the intruder. Running only on instinct, the samurai attacked the intruder, who seemed to appear out of nowhere, with a shuto strike to the forehead. But the intruder blocked the strike with an upper block, one that oddly gave the samurai a prick in his hand. Chian Kishi, I'm here to rescue you. Suddenly, the samurai's head started to hurt. His house seemed to melt and change and shift. The ground hardened beneath his feet, and his gi started to grow heavy. And then it all started to come back to him. Oh my god. Shihan Giuseppe Kishi stood in an unfamiliar mech, a woman with steel gray hair wearing a Word of Blake uniform standing in front of him. The last thing he remembered was being ambushed by a Word of Blake in nowhere before fighting as a samurai in feudal Japan. It was a dream of Giuseppe's to live in that simpler time, before technology, before space travel, to serve in that earlier era the way he served House Curita now. Word of Blake gave that to him, and then they twisted it. Looking around, he saw that he was in the waiting area where they kept him before he was sent out to kill his fellow Draconis Combine warriors. They had corrupted his dream. They had dishonored him. For that, they needed to be destroyed. Hey! One of the other Word of Blake soldiers said, You ain't supposed to be moving yet! Giuseppe raised the arm of the unfamiliar white mech that they called Vision of Judgment and fired the Gauss gun, ripping the soldier to pieces. The steel gray haired woman spoke with the voice of the intruder. This way, Shion, we can escape. No, Giuseppe said, we will not run away. Honor must be served. He activated all the armament in Vision of Judgment. Then, he walked forward. I was barely able to make it a safe distance before the ceiling of the Cilicia Coliseum collapsed, the work of its greatest fighter. Vision of Judgment, or rather, Shihan Giuseppe Kishi of House Curita, has battered the Coliseum, killing almost all of those inside and dying in the process. I don't know who will see this report, but I for one am glad that it will be my last tournament. For the final time, this is Mariko Guardado. Connor Delon, Koman of the Yakuza, switched the trivid image of Mariko off. The real Mariko sat trembling in the corner of the room. Patricia sighed. She had been hoping Miko would have been able to handle this better, but she was only a civilian. And very few civilians, indeed very few people, got to meet with someone as high-ranking as Connor was in the Yakuza. You've done, what you've done well. I'm sorry we couldn't get the Shihan out alive. Shaking his head, Connor said, eh, it's better this way. He died a hero. He could have hoped for no better end and no better way to reclaim his honor. And you have some nice footage, Mariko said hesitantly. You even have my famous face. Nice job. With no obvious sincerity, Connor said, thank you. He turned to Patricia. Our business is concluded. You will be paid as agreed. There's one change. The passage applies to both of us. Connor raised an eyebrow. Our agreement was with you, Sergeant Brackett. Ms. Guardado is not your concern, nor ours. Damn well is my concern. This only went down the way it did because of her getting me in. 
Besides, I can use her help. And why should this matter to us? Because, Mariko said, the trembling fading from her voice, I can do you more good as a fugitive than as a corpse. You toss me out of my ear, then word of Blake finds me, kills me, and turns my death into restitution for Kishi. You let me go with Patricia, I can do more pirate broadcasts. And not that crap Nero's doing. I mean real underground stuff. That'll help your cause. How do we know you will have the capability of producing these broadcasts? Connor asked with a small smile. Miko, bless her, gave him the same smile back. I got my methods. Besides, you're already helping Patricia out. What's adding me in the end? Passage off planet is difficult. Connor rubbed his chin. Patricia noticed that it was missing his pinky finger. But not impossible. And removing the vision of judgment under the cloud of betrayal has indeed been a fine victory for us. One that gives us leverage with House Curita. Your wish is granted. Patricia breathed a sigh of relief. She'd missed Miko and really wasn't too keen on the idea of her being killed right after Patricia had gotten back together with her. But she also knew she was in no position to demand anything from Connor Delon, so it was for the best that Miko did the convincing herself. Connor turned to Patricia. If you go to Shostakovich port in two hours and meet with a man named Nakamura, he will lead you to your passage. He pressed a button. A door slid open and the two no-necked thugs who had escorted them into Connor's office walked in. Patricia got the message right off, and after a second, so did Miko. They followed the two thugs out. So, Miko said, you gonna tell me what it is the Yakuza gave you in return? It's good to see you too, kiddo. You're not answering my question, Patricia. Very observant. They said nothing else as they left the building. Miko did not look happy. Well, tough. We did the job, now we finally get off this dirt ball. And we saved a big hero, not bad for a day's work. Oh, it cost me was my soul. Again, that is a classic Battletech story. Uh, originally appeared on Battlecore.com. Don't know where you can find it now. Uh, I've only done two things for Battletech. I was I. It never really uh, developed into any more than that. Uh, but I did another short story, also featuring Mariko and Patricia, called Three Sides to Every Story," which appeared in a big coffee table book called Twenty Five Years of Art and Fiction." Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, check me out online at tecantido.net, tecantido.wordpress.com, patreon.com slash crad, and also on tour.com where I write pretty regularly, currently doing a Star Trek Voyager rewatch uh, and a couple of superhero movie reviews and other things as well. Uh, so stay in touch. Keep watching the channel. I'll see you next week, and please stay safe.